Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. John, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, hi, I'm John J. Gahagan. I'm a, a journalist, a, an editor, and an author of uh, the book Operation Storm, Japan's Top Secret Plans to Change the Course of World War II. It's Operations Cherry Blossoms at Night. It's a real thing. And whenever you tell somebody about it, they go, that sounds insane. But how'd you get like, how'd you come across this operation? And if you wanted to give a little background about Unit 731, too. So, you know, my uh, my interest that led to the book, I actually started, I think it was around 2004 or 2005. There were news reports um, that a submarine, a Japanese submarine from World War Two had been located uh, off of Barber's Point, uh, not far from the entrance to uh, Pearl Harbor. And um, it was a quite an unusual submarine that news reports indicated. It was actually an, a giant, largest submarine ever built during World War II, uh, probably the largest submarine that, it, that was built until the uh, age of the nuclear submarines in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So gigantic sub um, that carried uh, three uh, airplanes, attack bombers, and a watertight deck hanger that it could launch off its bow. So and essentially, um, what caught my interest was uh, that it was an underwater aircraft carrier, and it had been built by Japan to be used against the United States during World War II. I'd never heard of this before. Uh, it just was remarkable. So I started to look into it, and I realized there was very little about um, – uh, about this submarine or this class of submarines in the Western historical record. Um, and then when I started to research in Japan, um, the thing that I found that was so remarkable is NHK, which is one of the national television station, the government television station in Japan, um, aired in, uh, a news segment about the discovery of the sub, and they ended up interviewing a gentleman uh, who was actually the captain of the of the flagship sub. He was still alive. He was in his 90s. So at that point, uh, I hopped on an airplane and went to Tokyo and tracked down Nambu-san and uh, ended up interviewing him for a cover story for Aviation History Magazine. And that's how I really began to understand that there was uh, something about the history of these uh, E-forward class of submarines that uh, was remarkable and, and that very few people in the West knew anything about. Now, when you interviewed him, did you ask him about like how he got even hooked up in that job in the first place, like to be the one that would carry out the operation? That's insane to me. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the remarkable thing about Nambusan, unfortunately, he he passed a few years ago and, and I interviewed him twice. Uh, the remarkable thing about him was uh, he was six feet tall, um, which for a, a pre-war Japanese person is just gigantic. Plus, if you think of that, he was the captain of a submarine, even if it was the world's biggest submarine. You don't want to be six feet tall when you're running around the narrow passages of a submarine because you're always banging your head against something. Um, you know, I, I initially had uh, went there to interview him about the E-401, um, which was the flagship sub in the Sentoku squadron of these gigantic underwater aircraft carriers. And, it, and we talked maybe the first time for three or four hours, recorded the interview. And when we were finished, you know, you always you will appreciate this in particular. Sometimes you get the best stuff in an interview after you've like turned off the cameras. So I turned off the cameras and and we were I was packing up my equipment and um, uh, he was telling me about a trip he had just made to New York City. And, uh, uh, you know, I was kind of just paying half his attention. But then I looked up at him and I said, well, was that the first time you've ever been to the United States? And he looked at me and he said, no, no, I've been to the United States before. And I said, well, when was the first time you'd ever been to the United States? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, Pearl Harbor. Oh, my God. And I said, like, wait, what do you mean Pearl Harbor? Well, it turned out that Namu was on um, on a, a Japanese uh, submarine, the uh, E-17, 
around the island of Oahu during the aerial attack on Pearl Harbor. He was the first officer on the sub, and his assignment was to sink any capital ships that might have attacked the raid. So at that point, I said to myself, whoa, this is a much more interesting story than I I could possibly have known, because basically Nambusan was one of the few uh, Japanese sub captains to actually survive the war. And he had fought the entire length of the war in the Sixth Fleet, which was the Japanese submarine arm of the Imperial Japanese Navy. So I knew this guy actually had a history of the entire war as a Japanese submarine captain and would have all sorts of insights that we in the West wouldn't necessarily ha have known about. Um, and of course, that's that's exactly what happened. When I, I originally I went back later and interviewed him for a documentary we did for PBS television. And and one of the things that quickly came out is that um so so Namusan was on the E-17 at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. A few days after the Pearl Harbor attack, the Imperial Japanese Navy's high command um ordered, I think it was nine of the 11 submarines around Oahu to deploy off the coast of California and begin sinking Allied shipping. Uh, people know that there were U-boats off the East Coast sinking um, American shipping during the beginning of World War II, but people don't realize that the Japanese coast was also lousy with Jap that California coast was lousy with Japanese submarines during that period. So um, so basically, uh, Nambu in the E-17, his first officer, uh, sailed up and down the California coast with impunity, sinking ships right and left all through December and January. He then, um, the sub was uh, went back to Kwajalein in the South Pacific, which was the Japanese submarine base to resupply, and then resurfaced in February off the coast of San Diego. And their mission, and you know, um, the the Pacific Fleet had originally been based in San Diego. It had been moved to Pearl Harbor in anticipation of war with Japan, but San Diego was still an important Navy port. So they were waiting there again, looking for capital ships. That was kind of the order of the day, is sink those aircraft carriers and battleships as they appeared. But then um, they got an order, and that was they were to select a land-based target off the coast of California, and to begin shelling it. And so in February of 1942, Nambu surfaced a few miles off the coast of Santa Barbara, near a town called Golita. It was about a mile offshore. And as he told me, they surfaced with the sun setting in the Pacific behind them, so the sub could not be seen well from shore. And they began to shell the Barnstable Oil Facility, which was the largest oil production facility on the West Coast. And I think over the course of a half an hour, they launched, I don't know, two dozen uh, shells in an attempt to try to set the facility on fire. And, and they did some damage, um, but it's, you know, submarines of any kind, whether they're American or they're Japanese, they're very unstable gun platforms because they're constantly rocking in the water. So they weren't able to hit their main target, which was this gigantic uh, aviation fuel tank, which had, I don't know, like 186,000 gallons of aviation fuel. They landed, they they put some shells pretty close to it, but they didn't hit it. Um, and then they uh, they retreated. And that was the first time that an American enemy had shelled the U.S. mainland since the British attacked New Orleans in the War of 1812. So it was, uh, you know, I realized this guy was at the center of, you know, a couple of very historic moments during World War II. Um, I get it. I'm jealous. I'm very jealous. <laughs> I, well, I would know, ask him about his mentality. About Nambu, I mean, he was a charming guy. He was very Renaissance, cosmopolitan. He wrote poetry. Uh, he ballroom danced. You know, he he was not your your kind of typical stereotypical Hollywood uh, idea of like Toshiro Mifune. You know, as a Japanese naval captain, um, he was really quite a charming guy. And and I got to know him and his son a bit. And and really enjoyed my time uh, with them because you know like you suggested earlier, Robbie. I mean, I went into this thing thinking like it's very important for me to be quiet and to listen because this guy has got a lot to say that we don't necessarily know about in the West. And in the West, we tend not to write about World War II history from the point of view of the Japanese. You know, we write it from the point of view of the victor. So um, I was really interested to, to get 
you know, fr firsthand from Namusan what it was like to serve on these submarines. And of course, he eventually uh, be became the uh, lieutenant commander and captain of the E-401, which was the flagship submarine in the squadron of E-400 subs. Um, and so he was the one who was in charge of training the men and um, on their mission. And, and you know, I, I'm not quite sure how much you know about this, but the mission of these, these unusual subs evolved over the course of the war. Um, so these E-400 subs, class of subs, they were basically giant underwater aircraft carriers. And they came about immediately after uh, Pearl Harbor. It was January of 1942. And... Uh, Admiral Isoroku Yasumoto, who was the commander in chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy, he was the guy who dreamed up the plan of the attack on Pearl Harbor. But the problem that, it, that Yamamoto had was he did not have a second act. He had no follow up punch to Pearl Harbor. Um, he knew he could knock the Pacific Fleet out of the action for six months, allowing Japan to kind of consolidate their gains in the South Pacific. But as he had told the prime minister, uh, he could not guarantee anything after the first six months because he knew. Yamamoto had, had actually uh, uh, lived in the United States. He'd been a naval attache and he attended Harvard. He knew what the production capacity was like in the U.S. He knew that we would bounce back quickly, and that concerned him. So he assembled his, uh, his you know, uh, uh, leading officers on board his flagship in January of 41 and said, look, OK, we've had a huge success at Pearl Harbor, but now we need to come up with something else. Um, because they're going to bounce back quickly, and we need to recognize that. And so what are we going to do? So they conceived of this plan of the Sentoku subs, these gigantic underwater aircraft carriers. And their purpose was originally to travel um, from Japan, you know, more than halfway around the world, surface off the east coast of New York City and Washington, D.C., and launch a second aerial attack against those two cities using these 44 attack bombers that they would be launched from the submarines. And the idea that Yamamoto had, but it, you know, and again, Western historians tend to, dis those who know about this mission, though they tend to dismiss it or poo-poo it, just like they did the attack on uh, the Goleta oil fields. Oh, they didn't inflict much damage. But, you know, again, that's kind of Victor's history, which is which is overlooking where the successes were. Um, when Nambu uh, attacked the Goleta oil facility, yeah, he did not destroy the facility, but that attack so freaked out the U.S. Naval High Command that it had to re redeploy its Navy ships for the next four years to escort American shipping up and down the California coast and to Hawaii and back, all because of launching 12 artillery shells. So in some ways, his attack on Santa Barbara was quite effective in terms of tying up our men and materials. And again, um, the attack on New York City and Washington, D.C., well, how much devastation could 44 attack bombers inflict? The truth is, not that much. But what was Yamamoto trying to do is he wanted to attack the heart and soul of the United States, which he defined as New York City and Washington, D.C., because he wanted to inflict an attack that was so psychologically devastating that it would force the United States to the negotiating table to sue for an early peace. So again, the military logic, the strategic logic of what he wanted to do made sense. You know, in, in retrospect, if you don't understand the context, you might go, well, that's kind of a crazy Hail Mary mission is bomb New York City and Washington, D.C. What do they what do they hope to gain from that? Well, they hope to gain a lot. Um, so, so that was the initial mission, the first mission for these Sentoku subs. The problem is because these were the largest subs in the world and they required a tremendous amount of steel to be built, it took much longer to build the subs than Yamamoto had anticipated. And so um, th as the subs were being constructed, the course of the war changed. You know, in, in June of 1942, the Battle of Midway took place, which was kind of the defining turning moment in the Pacific War, when the Americans went from the defensive at Pearl Harbor to the being on the offense. And the Japanese were thrown back on their heels, had to pull back all of their submarines from the California coast, and had to kind of set up a defensive perimeter in the South Pacific to protect themselves against the Americans who were who after the Battle of Midway started to really flow into the Pacific in, in strong numbers. 
So once that happened, um, the primary mission for the E-400 subs fundamentally changed. And they were told, look, it's not doesn't make any sense to send these guys against New York City and Washington, D.C. It's too late now. The Americans are now starting to knock on our back door. So what we need to do is uh, is attack the Panama Canal. And so the mission changed um, and the uh, plans were drawn up for the E-400 subs to um, to travel to the Caribbean, to launch their aircraft and have them bomb the Gatton locks in the Panama Canal, which was the choke point um, for U.S. men and materials flooding into the Pacific. You know, again, it makes a lot logical sense from a military standpoint is if your your enemy is flooding into the Pacific, but they're coming through only one gateway, and that's the Panama Canal, destroy that gateway and choke off their supplies so you get some breathing room to kind of rebuild your own forces. So that was the mission that the, that the E-400 subs were actually training for. Um, once the subs were completed and they didn't, and the subs took so long to build, they weren't really finished until late 1944, early 45. You know, and by that point, things were quite desperate for Japan. Um, the, the U.S. submarine fleet had, uh, you know, established an effective embargo around the island of Japan. It choked off most of Japan's supplies. They couldn't get the steel to complete the subs, which is one reason it took so long to build them. In fact, the construction on these gigantic subs required so much men and resources that other parts of the Japanese military machine were complaining about, oh, my God, we can't get what we want. What are you guys in the Navy doing about these subs? You know, it's sucking up all of our supplies. Uh, so but as the subs started to come online in uh, in late 1944, um, there were a number of what I call Hail Mary missions that were being discussed. Uh, because Japan was so desperate that they really wanted to try something that, that would change the course of the war, because clearly they were losing. And among these many Hail Mary missions, one of them that emerged was uh, this uh, Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night. It, it's also been called Operation PX. It's had several different names. Um, but uh, because by December 44, Basically, the U.S. was already in Japan's backyard, and so the strategists at the Imperial Japanese Navy were saying, gosh, it doesn't make any sense anymore to bomb the Panama Canal. It's too late for that. They're already here. You know, our island is under threat of invasion. What can we do um, to prevent that from happening? So there was a faction, and, and it's important to understand that it was only a faction um, of the Navy that said, look, let's let's use these e these gigantic underwater aircraft carriers not to attack the Panama Canal, but let's load these planes up with with uh, biological warfare material, bubonic plague, you know, and launch them against U.S. cities. Um, initially, the cities that were discussed were California, were West Coast cities, you know, like Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco was discussed. There was also some discussion later about East Coast cities. Um, and, but, you know, it was quite an unusual, uh, it was quite an unusual and I, I, I think, you know, desperate indication of desperate times that they were, that they were brainstorming, okay, what to do? Because, you know, the, the uh, Japanese army um, had this uh, uh, biological warfare unit, Unit 731 in uh, Harbin, China, in Manchuria. Um, uh, where they'd had basically for the entire war where they were conducting experiments with various biological weapons. Uh, you know, weapon, they were basically weaponizing uh, uh, diseases like cholera and typhus by, by infecting fleas with them and then uh, exposing their captured prisoners of war to these fleas that had typhus and cholera to see how long would it take for them to contract the disease and, and die. And they conducted these experiments among their prisoners of war, most of whom were Chinese, some were Australian, and I think there may have been a few Americans on that, though I'm not uh, entirely positive about that. But so this unit, 731, um, uh, you know, had, been, had basically existed for a large part of the war, um, and they had graduated from the um, experimental stage, you know, where they were doing these tests in controlled laboratory conditions. 
to actually putting the biological materials in bombs and dropping them on the Chinese countryside and infect, trying to infect cities that way. You know, by the way, I mean, between you and me, um, that, that's a very primitive form of biological warfare, not that efficacious. Um, but again, we're talking the 1940s and things were not that sophisticated yet when it came to biological weapons. Unfortunately, they would get a lot more sophisticated uh, much later uh, based on Soviet and American programs that preceded this program. Um, but, you know, the Japanese army was was definitely focused on doing this. If you even look at the plan of Operation Cherry Blossoms at night, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to get the number wrong, but a certain amount of fleas that would have bubonic plague. I mean, if you look at that from a strategic standpoint, I don't know if you've ever tried to kill a flea in your house before. It's damn near impossible. So if you look at just letting that hit the countryside with a whole swarm of them just going around, I mean, it's going to infect so quickly. And to me, like that, like that's the thing is that there'll be people that like the probably more Western historians that might have a certain viewpoint of like why this one never even gets mentioned because it didn't go out. It didn't fulfill. It didn't succeed. It didn't wasn't implemented. It doesn't matter when you look at like Japan, and I'm sure you probably have a different perspective, but when you're looking at Japan and you're hearing from a personal stories from someone that you're interviewing from their experience and you kind of start going, you guys were just really strategic. I mean, America has always had this torch all method, which is like we need to go there full force right now and this type of mentality. But if you look at what Japan was planning with their very strategic bombings and all this. I mean, if they would have had maybe the time and would have had it at a faster capacity, would we live in a whole different other society right now? I mean, a lot of their plans that could have been considered failures would have been successful. But that's what I try and keep in mind when, like, when I talk to someone who's like very critical of the government, and I'm pretty critical of the government, but I go – you wonder why all these people are doing weird experimentations. This I'm like, cause everybody's doing it. Everybody's thinking like this. You start seeing it in everybody's country and you just go, I'm glad. Like, I mean, I hate to say it's happening out there, but we know it's going to happen, whether it's in this country, if we just ban it here or do whatever, but, and I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying when you start learning about other people's histories, whether it's Russia or it's China or it's Japan, you start going, okay, so it's not us that's just doing this. It's everybody has like the gun to each other's head. And it's like, who's going to be the one that pulls the trigger or reloads first? I have no clue. Yeah, I think you're right, Robbie. I mean, everybody's hands are dirty to some, to some extent, you know, when it comes to trying to find the weapon that's going to be most effective. And, and that's true, as true today as it was during World War II. Um, uh, you know, if you there's a, a terrific book that was written about uh, Unit 731 by a, a guy named Hal Gold, G O L D. Um, I, it may be out of print, but I but it's still floating around. Definitely worth reading because I think he, uh, Mr. Gold, really had some uh, interesting insights into what was actually going on there um, at that at that uh, biological warfare unit. But you know, the thing that was always most shocking about it is that the um, the Japanese army officer who was in charge of that unit, Unit 731, when the war ended, he was not prosecuted as a war criminal. Um, he, like Werner von Braun, he was uh, sought out and given immunity by the uh, Allied Armed Forces in exchange for the knowledge of his weaponry and what he was working on. Well, he used to hang the five slowest Jews at his rocket facility. And he did. I mean, he. he created our whole space program basically in the Nuremberg trials. And I mean, it's at this, I, I try and look at it from both perspectives. Like that's kind of, I try and keep a balanced approach. It's horrible stuff. I don't justify any of it, but they were like, they already did the research. We can burn the notes and just keep the moral ethic of not touching this, but they already did it. So are you going to let it go to waste? And it's just like, I don't like, I, it, ma it makes history a little bit more complicated um, not only in an aspect of like, I mean, we did a lot of our space stuff does come from a lot of those ideas, which is a side of history that is not publicly told. It's more like if you go down the specific route of learning it. You know, what's so remarkable, too, about about the Japanese Navy's um, interest in uh, using biological materials to attack the United States is is that historically the Japanese Imperial Navy and the and the Japanese Imperial Army they never really got along that well they didn't see eye to eye the the Japanese army was always considered to be the most extreme of the military branches you know the most gun ho the most hardcore the Imperial Japanese Navy tended to see themselves as better educated uh, more you know well-rounded open-minded 
So it, it gives you some indication of just how desperate the conditions must have been during the war at the very end in Japan for the Navy, which was supposed to be the reasonable branch, to come up with this idea of, OK, let's 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 load up these biological weapons in our underwater aircraft carriers and send them to attack American cities. But what's interesting is the Navy did not have any biological weapons capability. So they had to go to the Army and basically ask for the cooperation of this unit, 731, to get the materials. So though the Navy had the, the Navy High Command had signed off on this uh, on this mission to a certain extent, when it got to the um, to go to the, the Imperial Japanese Army and, and make a request for the biological materials from Unit 731, I have a quote here. Um, there was a um, there was an Imperial Japanese Army uh, staff general who was named Umetsu. And when Umetsu heard the Navy's plan, he said, quote, the operation is unpardonable. If a virus is used, war between Japan and the U.S. will escalate to war against all humanity. And Japan will be the subject of derision and destruction. It is against humanitarian grounds. That's crazy because I, I was just about to ask you about their biological weapon capabilities, if they had a better containment process with it, because I know we had a troubled past with uh, biological and chemical weapons as well too, being able to produce it and also contain it as well. So I'm curious if they, I mean, if he's aware of it, it is that ethic guideline. Like, what do we do when we release this kind of, it's like opening Pandora's box. I mean, I'd be worried about having it on my sub. Well, you know, again, it was, I mean, the, the kind of biological weapons they're talking about, you know, they, first of all, they had to breed the fleas. So, you know, they wouldn't go out and collect fleas. They would, the, the unit 731 actually bred the fleas and the insects at the unit. And then they would expose them to typhus and cholera. Um, and, and at that point, you know, you have to package it all into a bomb um, and have, and then have the bomb drop uh, and have these creatures released, you know, they have to survive that fall and they have to be released. So there's a lot of steps that have to be taken for these weapons to be effective. And, 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 and so the truth is, you know, you have to ask all, well, how effective were they? You know, so because they, they, they did do experiments in China using these weapons and they did end up uh, spreading uh, cholera and typhus as a result. But the biggest hurdle in any kind of biological weapon is always the deployment. You know, they it's it's not that difficult for a lot of these weapons to actually uh, create the material. It's how do you weaponize it in an efficacious manner? Um, and, and again, I'm no expert on it, but I know that in, in the past American and Soviet uh, chemical weapons programs, that is always the huge hurdle is they can make this stuff, but how do you spread it in an effective way? And I'm glad it's not easy um, uh, because for our own benefit, for the benefit of humanity, as General Umetsu in Japan uh, realized, uh, because these are really Satan weapons. You know, these are just not good things. Yeah. When you read that quote, I thought of Oppenheimer when you said, I became death destroyer of worlds. Um, after testing the atom bomb or nuclear bomb. Um, that's just, it's something that, I mean, at least they're aware that like, this is going to lead to nothing but destruction. But I even think with our chemical and biological weapon past, the issue was containment, um, which is when you launch it, I mean, everything, like, especially using chemical weapons, it just, it all sprays in the air. I think even eventually the German soldiers just put mask, gas mask on. That's why we have a whole bunch of pictures of them just wearing gas masks because, it's good for a small enclosed spot. That's why there's a lot of buildings now that test for anthrax bombs and things of that sort, because that's where it's mostly usable or effective. I mean, if you're trying to lay it out on a battlefield, it's, it doesn't really do what we thought it intended to do. Right. I mean, you know, you can have uh, you know counter prevailing winds, um, which all of a sudden send this stuff in the exact wrong direction. Um, that there's a lot of variables that can affect the uh, the efficaciousness of biological biological weapons. Well, with Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night, did did you ask anybody about why they used fleas, or did you find out why they were going to use fleas? To me, that was just like a weird one off for me, where I was like, they're going to choose fleas. I mean, it's smart if because they're small and they're kind of jump all around, but most of the time when we talk about biological weapons or doing something that's rats or something that is a little bit larger that can breed or do something, I guess, at, I don't know why, I guess maybe the size. 
Well, you know, I'm speculating here, but cholera and typhus, um, you know, were spread in in the natural world through fleas. Um, and I think uh, that using the fleas and insects was just the kind of shortest distance to recreating what seemed to work in the real world. Um, again, that's speculative on my part, but I think that was the, the logic. Hal Gold's book about Unit 731 goes into it in a lot more detail. Um, but it, that's it, that's what I recall is is uh, basically the reason why they were using insects and not anything else. And you know, the learning was still a very it, it was very early stages in the whole history of biological weapons. Um, so the learning, you know, a lot of what they were doing in in at Unit Seven Thirty One was trying to figure out what worked and what didn't work. Um, they were they were kind of pioneers in that regard. Did this, I mean, any plans like this, even if it didn't go to, or it didn't fulfill or didn't get implemented, did they start thinking about a capacity to be able to replicate other ideas of this sort as like a weapon tactic with biological weapons, or did they just kind of like stop a little bit shortly after? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not following your question. So like using subs for biological weapon deployment, I mean, was this like a innovative step? Was this something that they continued later down the road? I mean, to me, that just sounds nuts. I mean, even hearing that there's a bubonic plague weapon, um, that's shocking for a lot of people. But I'm just talking about the subs capacity. Um, did they start implementing the Navy with more weapons of this sort to think of uh, future attacks or future strategies with it? Well, you know, I think that the, 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 in the Japanese war machine was pursuing a lot of different av avenues when it came to weaponry. Um, just like we were, you know, in the, you know, we were pursuing radar and, you know, wireless guided bombs and, you know, all, you have a kind of a smorgasbord of weapons programs going on because you don't know which ones are going to pan out. You know, some, some over time emerge as more important than others. Obviously, radar was a critical one. Um, and I think that's true for what was going on with the biological weapons study in Japan is that they, they, um, they didn't know what the, where, how it would ultimately pan out. They were just they're looking for a competitive advantage and they um, whether they're going to build a gigantic underwater aircraft carrier or or biological weapons program in Manchuria, you know, they're going to pursue multiple paths to see which one of these might offer, um, uh, you know, a strategic advantage when it came to the war. And I'm not sure that they always knew up front, you know, in the case of the, these uh, E-400 class submarines, you know, was Yamamoto's idea. But Yamamoto was uh, killed uh, halfway through the war. You know, he was um, he was attacked by uh, U.S. fighter planes and his plane was shot down and he died. And so once Yamamoto was killed, then there's kind of like the the big kahuna who's responsible for that program is no longer there to support it. So then there, you've always got people in the wings who don't agree with, with, you know, a particular program. So then they start kind of eating away at it. And I think that's kind of what happened here. It's why you went at, you saw the mission creep that happened with these subs from attacking the East Coast to attacking the Panama Canal to being considered as uh, deployers of biological weaponry against East Coast cities. And then ultimately what happened, which was at the very end, the mission was changed to redirect the subs um, against uh, the island of Ulithi in the South Pacific because that was the gathering place for the U.S. invasion forces, that's where the uh, aircraft carrier flat tops and the battleships were uh, were were basically uh, being based there uh, in its deep lagoon in preparation for invading Japan. And once the Japanese realized, okay, the, the invasion's coming and they're going to stage it out of Ulithi, then they redirected these the surviving Sentoku subs on a suicide mission to head to Ulithi and sink their carrier forces there. So you know. I, these 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 super weapons or these you know uh, uh, you know master plans they are they're subject to reality and as the war changed and fates changed uh, the ultimate deployment of the weapons changed. Are you surprised that we don't ever talk about stuff like this in our history books at all? I mean, there is a large rejection from I guess certain i guess history especially us i mean i get the winner aspect of writing down gets to create the history books but not even a mention i mean i had to learn about this like my first year into podcasting which is surprising and it's still shocking whenever you mention it to someone they just 
like I said, roll their eyes and say, that sounds like conspiratorial, like flat earth nonsense. It's like, well, it's not, it's, it's a real plan, but I mean, even the name, I don't know if that's was a play on words or if it was, you know, meant to make people just scoff and roll their eyes. But I mean, it's a real thing. Unit 731 is real as well, too. But we do not talk about that at all. Everyone's example is the Nazis or it brings up to something else. Yeah. You know, I, I, I had the same reaction, Robbie, when, uh, you know, and of course, I wrote the book Operation Storm to try to uh, introduce into the Western historical record, um, you know, what was going on with these remarkable subs and what was the logic behind it? You know, not not an excuse for the behavior, but an explanation, you know, of, of why these things were built. And, and one of the challenges I had in the book is I, I really did try to write aspects of the book from the Japanese point of view. Um, I, I used to live and work in Japan, and I speak some Japanese, and so I, I had some insight and understanding and appreciation for the culture and what they were uh, dealing with. And so I thought it would be an interesting uh, kind of intellectual task um, to, to tell the story of the E-400 subs and their, their evolving mission um, from the Japanese point of view and to try to set the record straight so that, um, you know, when you read about the Western historians who talked about, oh, the E-17 shelling of Santa Barbara, well, that, that was insignificant. Well, it wasn't insignificant, you know, and when the, um, they firebomb, when the Japan, Japanese launched um, uh, an airplane off the E-25 off the coast of, Aragon, of, of Oregon in September and October 1942 to drop incendiary weapons on the Oregon forest, you know, a lot of Western historians kind of roll their eyes and scoff at that and go, well, that was ludicrous. Well, for those of us who live on the West Coast, I live in Northern California, we know what the fire season is like in September. Um, and the Japanese had a very strategic plan. They wanted to drop incendiaries into the Oregon forests when they were tinder dry in September because they saw the drought as a force multiplier. They, they again, wanted to inflict a psychological uh, 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 you know, attack that would be devastating on the American on the American people. Now we could roll our eyes about that, but if you take a step back, it does make lo it is logical sense from a military standpoint to do that. How come we don't apply that same kind of uh, eye rolling to our uh, Doolittle attacks on Tokyo? You no, know, we we look at the Doolittle air raids on Tokyo in April of '42 as this really historic undertaking. Well, the truth of the matter was, it was kind of a ridiculous mission. It didn't accomplish anything militarily. It was just a tit for tat for Pearl Harbor. You know, we wanted, they punched us, so we wanted to punch them. So we launched these poor guys, you know, off a flat top um, south of Japan. They they barely made it to Tokyo. They dropped a few bombs, which did minimal damage. Some of them crashed and shot down. Some of them captured in China. Well, I mean, that was kind of a ridiculous waste of time and resources, but that's not how we would view it from the Western point of view. So I was just trying to take maybe a more even-handed approach to understanding why people did what they did during during World War II, and the Operation Storm book gave me a chance to do that. No, I appreciate a perspective like that. Um, whenever you talk about a subject like this or you write from a perspective like that, people will look like label you a communist or they'll say something like that, but it's it's not that at all. And like we have this idea of being the only way you can be a patriot is if you only support everything we do like America, hell yeah, apple pie, all this type of stuff. Well, for me, I'm a patriot at heart, but I'm also very critical of just intelligence agencies. I'm critical of our government. I'm critical of everything. Cause there's always another perspective that you're not seeing. It's like, um, there's a really good quote out there and it's about, uh, when we were going against the Nazis, I think for the second time, it was talking about how for every germ, a German tank, one German tank was like, 10 of our tanks but for every one of theirs we had 11 so it was like that extra one and we just kind of kept popping them out like mcdonald's our weaponry and it was theirs was way more i guess time and work put into theirs but ours was like mcdonald's factory just cranking them out and it kind of starts to change a little bit and that's not what the history books kind of tell you you know they always talk about the good strong talking points and talking with like peter kuznick from untold history of the u.s you know when he talks about nagasaki and hiroshima you know, he was correcting me on so much because all mine just comes from Western education that kind of tells you the whole one sided view of things. And he's giving me, no, this is the other side, which what their history books don't tell you. And he kind of start learning, I guess, a little bit more of a balanced approach. I mean, from talking to the I, I'm going to I don't want to mess up on his name, but the person you mentioned in the beginning um, when you were interviewing him, I mean, did 
did you start learning, I guess, more about like through his eyes? I mean, he must have shared some amazing stories with you, but also did he ever question any of the things that was going on? I mean, that's when I bring up that Oppenheimer quote before about like, I there are some horrible things that happen where I think even some people that are on the side that's going to be doing that even questions like, is this a little bit too far? Well, you know, I, I mean, th they say war is hell for a good reason. Um, and I think war is hell for both sides. Uh, it, um, when I was interviewing Nambu and and getting a, a sense of what his his naval career had been like, um, you know, he he was a very kind of a reasonable, well balanced guy. He ended up uh, uh, becoming an admiral in the Japanese Self Defense Force um, after the war. Was a very senior level guy, part of the Joint Chiefs of Staff there. Um, and so he had maybe a more international and cosmopolitan, a more balanced point of view of things. But, you know, these guys that I interviewed, and Nambu introduced me to a number of people, like Yadasan, who was his first officer, who also became an admiral, um, and a number of his officers and crew of the subs who were still alive. And I went and interviewed them, and, and I got a kind of range of responses. There was a gentleman, his name was Asamura-san. He was the squadron leader for the sarin attack bombers that were to be launched off the E-401 sub to attack our uh, naval forces at Ulithi. Um, and now, and Asamura-san, he was a very difficult character. He was a, a you know, kind of an unreconstructed rightist, uh, nat Japanese nationalist. Um, and, and, and I used to joke, you know, that, that Asamura-san was ready to get back into his sarin air attack bomber and come here and finish the job. Um, because that was the general sense I got from him every, every time I interviewed him. So that there was a kind of a wide variety of, of responses. Um, but, you know, pe but people in Japan, they, they just like we have our patriots, they had their patriots. And they, you know, they thought that they were, um, that they had logical reasons for doing what they were doing. And, and one, what I kept hearing was, you know, the attack on, on Pearl Harbor, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, shouldn't really have been a surprise. Um, because um, if you dug into the history, at least from the Japanese point of view, you know, the Japanese were very interested in be, uh, having a seat at the table. They wanted to be part of the big five allies, you know, which was uh, uh, Italy, France, America, England, you know, Germany, and Japan wanted a seat at that same table. And we did not want them to have a seat at that table. Um, we, just like China today, we saw them as a, as a major competitor, a strategic rival. And so it was to our uh, advantage to kind of keep them down. And uh, as they uh, militarized and became uh, and had world power aspirations and, and invaded China uh, and uh, you know, we we all saw that as a very alarming, uh, a very alarming development, um, and that they would eventually become uh, a challenge to us. So, you know, at, at one point by the early 1940s, we had embargoed all the oil and all the scrap metal that was sent to Japan. I think Japan got 80 percent of its scrap metal from us. Well, at the point that we embargoed oil against Japan, Japan's an island nation; they have no oil resources themselves. In, in many respects, the way the Japanese felt about it was that we'd given them no choice. We pushed them into war. They needed to have an oil supply. The Dutch East Indies, which is known as Indonesia today, they had oil rigs. They had oil production. And so the Japanese said, we've got to get that oil supply because we only have two years left of oil here in Japan. And what are we going to do if we don't have any oil? And so one of the primary goals of attacking uh, Pearl Harbor and knocking the Pacific fleet out of action was so that Japan could invade the Dutch East Indies oil fields and have a supply of oil. Well, all of this was kind of known in advance to the uh, to the American administration. Roosevelt knew what was going on. I mean, Roosevelt had been preparing for war, um, you know, for several years. Um, so in, in many respects, I guess my point is, is that Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor shouldn't have been such a surprise because it made tremendous strategic sense from the Japanese standpoint. And you understand that when you talk to them. Um, it, it, um, well, we got a tip off about Pearl Harbor, too. 
push the Japanese into doing it, which again is not something that they would teach us in our high school history books. I can't remember if it was a couple of months earlier, but there is a document out there or, or one that was destroyed that was talked about a, well, there was a copy of a document that we do have, which talks about a tip off. It was a threat that Pearl Harbor or this a type of attack was going to happen. And we did not take that at face value either. And that was destroyed. Um, that is common. Like I've heard that from Peter Kuznick and a bunch of people who have talked about that, but they consider it like, oh, you get multiple threats or whatever, you know, how many are you going to take at face value? But if you look at Pearl Harbor, what I think is important, I've been there and it is a very emotional situation when you go to that memorial and it is something, and I've seen, and I'll tell you, it will spark up anger when you see people from just taking selfies in front of all the names that are on there. But what I think the important value in that is, how do you think they feel when we go there and we take pictures at whatever they whatever they have that's a memorial place for dropping of the bombs or something i think it's that pillar that's still there even after the bombs fell yes and i think when you understand the other kind of culture as well too i think it the most important part about this is is not like it's not a photo moment it's even harder with my generation and probably younger that are really disconnected from this piece in history but it's also like you understand the cultural significance that impact it had i mean look at the russians and the fact with We've never had a war on our shores, a full on onslaught. But if you look at those people, people who live in Russia, I have friends who live in Romania or Bulgaria, they talk about, I mean, they're a couple generations away from of actual people that went through legit war hell on their home front. And we haven't really experienced something like that. But I think it's it doesn't only bring another perspective into the argument, but it also tries to bring understand understanding into the fact of like what we really need to do is respect the fact that these are memorial sites. They're not photo opportunities. They're people that still have significant pain from a trauma that is inflicted into their past. And I think, you know, you going over to Japan, you must've saw a bunch of cultural experiences that probably change your American thinking in a sense as well too. And it doesn't mean you're becoming soft or what people would say like, Oh, you're just becoming a communist. That's not it at all. It's just kind of understanding that people are people. And you kind of realize that, I mean, a couple of stories you were explaining about how the army didn't like the Navy. That's over here. The Air Force, you need a 90 something IQ or something. You got to get something on a test that's like a 90 percent and that gets you classified in the Air Force. People call them jarheads and over here in the States because they look down on them. That's that's similar. And you start realizing there's way more similarities than there are differences, which. Yes. Yeah. Robbie, I think that is so true. I mean, again, when I was trying to understand the war from the Japanese point of view, it wasn't that I was looking to excuse behavior. It was like I was trying to understand. I wanted to explain. I wanted to figure out, OK, uh, why did people do what they did? And like you say, at the end of the day, there ends up being tremendous similarities, maybe more similarities than differences between um, what was going on in Japan and what was going on in the United States. Um, and, and that's very hard for the other for, you know, the other side to think, well, what, they're similar to me? No, because basically what's going on during the war is we're trying very hard to demonize the other side, to make them look, you know, really bad and to justify our actions. But it's it's like you said, it's a lot more nuanced and complicated than that. People have reasons for doing what they do. You know, I, I can remember when I was doing research for Operation Storm, the um, the Sentoku fleet's commander, the squadron commander, was a guy named er Arizumi, Tatsunosuke Arizumi. Um, and he had been a sub-captain in the uh, Indian Ocean uh, during the, the earlier part of the war. And one of the things he was famous for was um, he would sink British merchant ships, and then he would surface, and he would machine gun the survivors, you know, which is a kind of a heinous crime, you know? And, and I was thinking, like, God, this guy is definitely the villain of my story. You know, look at all these horrible things that he's done. And then when I started to research, you know, I came across, okay, there was a, um, originally the Japanese submarine forces policy during the war was not to submarine the crews of sunken ships, um, uh, but was to, you know, take them on board or rescue them. And then that changed. And I said, well, why would it change? And then as I researched it, I realized, okay, what the Japanese uh, Imperial Navy realized was that um, the, the United States was very effective at replacing sunken ships. They had tremendous, we had a tremendous production capacity. So we could, when they sunk a ship, we could just spit out another one in record time. But what we had a much more difficult time replacing were the crews. 
So they made it a, a, a calculated decision that if they killed the crews on these ships, it would be to their strategic advantage because it would be harder for men, for us to staff these sh the next wave of ships. Now, from a military standpoint, that logic makes perfect sense. From a humanitarian standpoint, it's a hor it's a horrendous policy. But each side was equally guilty of having horrendous policies. You know, we, we gave the Medal of Honor to a, a U.S. sub captain who sunk a, a Japanese military troop carrier and machine gunned their crew in the water. You know, so what I'm saying is it's kind of like I really wanted to understand what was going on. I didn't want to have blinders on from the kind of American history book lessons that I've been taught. I wanted to see what, you know, to, to try to dig beneath the surface and really get at what was the logic and the motivation behind some of these actions that were taking place during World War II. Did you look at um, the propaganda and the influence of just what it did to condition us to what we consider morally valuable? Um, that's, I mean, it's a difficult question, I guess, right there, because I, I, just, I can only speak because looking more at the Nazis and it's what I've talked about way more than I have Japan's history, but the propaganda we had, which was like, never trust a German soldier. And then a lot of this was like, even with the civilians was to show like, look, they might be rebuilding churches, but it's all a ploy. And it is kind of conditioning brainwashing. You never trust them. But I mean, even moments where uh, you, I've read, I've read diaries of German soldiers, like actually just giving someone a cigarette to smoke a cigarette and the American soldiers spitting it out or doing whatever, like spitting on them and just having this complete rejection. It was like, because there's other people that would give them a cigarette and then use them or shoot them in the back of the head. And that might not have been that guy. So you kind of have to keep the balanced approach there. But I feel like with our moral values of obviously Americans, we consider human life way more valuable than equipment. But and it depends on how you think of death. If you die in the line of duty, a lot of people say, screw this. This is horrible. I can't believe I lost my family member. In another scenario, it's an honorable death. It's something that's you lost your life, giving it for your country. I know plenty of families, friends of family members that have you know lost someone and they see it like that. And it's kind of how we justify it to ourselves, but also our moral, moral values based on where we draw a line in the sand of divided on states, not even to states, just the countries as well. You know, I, I have to say, I mean, this is a this is a banal observation, but you know, war is the ultimate breakdown in 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 logical behavior. The, the, it, it's to be avoided at all costs. I don't think there's any such thing as a good war. I think both sides, all sides that are fighting in a war, are, are you know suffer terribly, and that. Um, uh, I'd love to see the human condition and the human intellect change in such a way that we could uh, we could stop having these terrible conflicts because nobody's going to benefit from them at the end of the day. Just, you know, even if you look at the situation in the Ukraine, you know, and in and, and general, um, you know, I think the general feeling is, is, you know, the Ukraine is terribly put upon. It's just terrible that they've been invaded by the Soviets. And and. And even though they seem to be winning the war, look at the price that the poor Ukrainians are paying for currently being ahead in that battle. I mean, they're wiping out the infrastructure, the electricity, the water. You know, people are suffering. There's just nothing that's good that comes from war. I think when you look at the spider web of politics and you realize what can like a certain I mean, saying like even John Cena apologizing for wrecking uh, recognizing Taiwan as a country because his new Fast and Furious movie was getting out there. That was a, it's like, oh my God, our actors now have to be like worried about the whole interweb of politics because China got very mad at us for that. They were like, we do not recognize Taiwan as a country. And then they were pissed off at the US. And it's like, that's the thing is you don't understand the complexity where even just, you know, going over and setting up a base, even if it's on neutral land, can be seen as an action of war or giving supplies to someone that you might be friends with, but might not be an allied force of whoever might be, might be having conflict with. That is seen as an act of aggression or an act of war and it's like that's why i always laugh when someone goes i can run this country i was just like dude i don't care who you think's in office man that's not an easy job whoever it is because you got to look at the complexity of what a spider web of politics is i mean it's invested in everything our military it's invested in uh movies it's invested in education systems it, it's it's all over the place you literally can't get away with it but 
that's a society thing too. I mean, look at debates, look at courtroom proceedings. Is it really trying to get the logical truth out or is it just, this is my side, not, you know, my side has to win. That's why I like, I hate the debates. It's like a show watching people just argue back and forth, but I don't, I, I think, you know, wars are obviously the ending grand scale of everything, but we have all these minor conflicts in our everyday life. And the fact that like conversation like me and you are doing, this doesn't happen every day. You know, a lot of people might talk to the people that they like, but also, I mean, when you created your work, did you have any resistance for just people that were just upset that you were writing and trying kind of looking from the other perspective? I've noticed that a lot through like trying to see the other perspective is that people don't necessarily like that viewpoint. Yeah. I mean, it was very unusual for that a, a, a Western history book write about World War II from the point of view of the Japanese. Um, and, and I definitely uh, got some uh, uh, emails and letters uh, from people who, uh, you know, some of them were, were surprised at what I was saying and, and accepted it. Some of it challenged what I was saying. Some of it were, was offended by what I was saying. And I didn't set out to write this book to offend anybody. It, what I was trying to do was shed more light on what was a very complex and nuanced situation. Um, and, and, and I guess part of my own personal philosophy is, you know, I want to know what the other guy thinks. I'm interested in, in, in uh, talking less and listening more and, and trying to hear um, what it is that's motivating uh, somebody, you know, Taiwan, which you mentioned earlier, is is a perfect example. I've been to China, I've been to Taiwan. I have tremendous respect for both countries. The, they're remarkable in 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 many ways. But you know, what never gets talked about in terms of Taiwan is when the nationalists fled communist China. They basically invaded Taiwan and took over that country. That was not their country. You know, there were native Taiwanese Taiwanese you know, who were indigenous to that island, who completely got wiped out as a result of the, the nationalist takeover of Taiwan. So, uh, you know, again, it's it's not a black or white situation. A lot of these situations, if you scratch the surface, they're quite complex. They're very nuanced. Um, you know, so the Taiwanese nationalists are in there and, and well-established and, and are, are fighting for their sovereignty. And, and I can understand and respect that. But at the same time, um, they kicked the little guy out in order to do that, <laughs> which is something that's not often discussed. Um, you know, when it comes down to the simple China versus Taiwan, you know, China, the big bully and Taiwan, the little guy fighting for survival. Um, it's a lot more it's a lot more complicated than just that. Do you think that like, I mean, even with perspectives of trying to see like the other like we should have that more broadcast it on national television at least when it comes to at least more programs in the u.s like more news segments on just an aspect of having a conversation with someone from an opposing view like i would like to see a whole history channel that's dedicated to not just one-sided history but more of like it's going to be difficult for people to sit down and try and get themselves to understand it. But I feel like once they start getting like 10, 15 minutes into a program about Pearl Harbor, I mean, they play the same thing every single year. It's that three hour something movie of Pearl Harbor. And it's like, look, I learned a lot about that movie. I learned that we had to get justification from Japan before that movie was even created. There was a scene where a guy was getting lit up on the, in the background on a gunship. Um, and it was just in the background and Japan's like, take it out. And we're like, I was like, what? Why would they say take it out? I was like, you don't need that extra stuff. You got your main point through. And obviously we had our drawing lines like, hey, this is you heard us. So we're going to put this out there. But there was a mutual agreement on the shared film. It was government influence for sure, but it was mutual agreement. Like it's about kind of like, I wonder if people could really sit through and see something from like an opposing view or like, what were the people going through on the opposite side, the people that were flying those ships? And we always get like a really crappy or like, not not saying your work i'm saying like just history books in general teach a very shabby version of maybe a little bit of like oh you had one guy that thought hey you had doubts or something like that i would like to see a full in-depth discussion of what was going on in the minds of these people how were they thinking about it were they think were they thinking this is america and they need to die or were they saying look this is our strategic advantage here that that's it that little that little line right there is such a big impact to the story where it's like you would have a lot more people that would be less hostile towards another country if you saw it from that perspective yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, the, 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 
the 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 challenge is is the medium. What medium do you use? Because for me, I tend to focus on books because it allows you to get into more uh, 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 complex and nuanced discussions. You don't have time constraints. You don't have to worry about uh, advertising supported dollars to tell your story. The problem with things like um, uh, 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 television programming, documentaries, movies, is that um, you know these are, are usually ad supported mediums and it's all about uh, entertainment and the ratings. And so if you are gonna take, uh, uh, and so there's not a lot of time or interest or money available for a more balanced approach. You know, it, it's it's often um, what sells is more the same. What's worked in the past, not necessarily something that's new or 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 takes a 360 degree view uh, to an issue. So, um, you know, there, there's a, a historian out there, a really, really noted historian named John Dower. I think he's um, a Harvard historian. He's written a number of books about Japan in World War Two, all of which are worth reading. Um, because he, I think of uh, he and, and he inspired me. I would think more than any other single historian, um, in terms of his uh, uh, taking a very complex and nuanced read on what was going on in Japan and what motivated them and why they behaved the way they did. So that's something I would encourage, encourage your listeners if they if they ever get the chances is look up John Dower D O W E R and and he wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book about called Embracing Defeat about post war Japan. He wrote a, a number of books about what Japan was going on in Japan during World War II, uh, from the Japanese point of view, um, that that are really worth that are really worth reading. They'll give you exactly what you're looking for, which is that more well-rounded uh, approach. Well, look, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show. Um, it does mean a lot. Um, I appreciate the conversation. Is there a place where people can find your links um, to any of your books and anything else you'd like to promote if you have a Twitter or any other social media? Well, you know, I have a website, um, uh, which is my name, um, which uh, uh, is impossible to spell. It's www.john, J-O-H-N, J, Gehagen, G-E-O-G-H-E-G-A-N.com, John J. Gehagen.com. Uh, my family name is actually uh, uh, Gaelic, um, which I think is like proof that the Irish can't spell, which is why sometimes people have tr trouble finding me online. But, um, you know, all, all of my books, um, I've written four nonfiction uh, books, um, two focused on on uh, military history, one being Operation Storm about these uh, gigantic underwater aircraft carriers. And my most recent book, is about the US Navy airship program during the 20s and 30s. It's called When Giants Ruled the Sky. And I th think the thing these two books have in common that people might find interesting is it is it really what I've attempted to do is, 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 is you suggested earlier, is get beneath the superficial and and um and and in terms of research and really dig down and find out what was really going on. Um, what was up with these particular programs? What were their strengths? What were their weaknesses? What were their successes, their failures? And most importantly, what was the human component that was driving them? Um, so, and, and they can find my books in any bookstore or on Amazon, as long as I can spell my name correctly. <laughs> well, John, I'm going to link all your links in the description, man. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.